guys, it's Miss Ferguson here uh, to talk to you about Tristan Eaton, who's the artist who's going to be the artistic inspiration for your legacy project. So that's him. And he's standing in one of in front of one of his murals, many murals. He was born in 1978. So he's a contemporary artist. He's American, um, although he has lived in some other cities like London. Um, and this is one of his murals, which you may even have seen. It's in Little Italy in New York, and it's obviously of the Statue of Liberty. And I put in a few different pictures of it so you could see it finished just as its own artwork on the left. And then you can also see um, the scale of it on this actual building. And you can see him working on it on a cherry picker, right? So obviously it's all very carefully laid out. Um, I'm guessing probably using some kind of projection technique and then um, filled in. So he started out as a street artist, so doing um, more uh, graffiti type stuff uh, when he was growing up in L.A. And then actually became a toy designer, which is pretty cool, and then did some advertising. And now primarily is known for his murals, which people now pay him to do, and also for his large scale paintings. So sometimes he works on the side of buildings. Sometimes he works on canvases. Canvas is just, uh, it's the fabric. It's actually the same fabric that we use uh, underneath clay pieces when we're working. But if it's stretched out over uh, basically like a wooden frame so that it's taut, it's tight, uh, that's a surface that painters traditionally paint on. Uh, no matter what surface Eaton's work is on, whether it's on the side of a building like this um, Audrey of Mulberry Street, which is of Audrey Hepburn and is also a mural, um, also in Little Italy, or whether it's uh, like the image on the left, Revolt, which is on canvas, you can right away recognize, okay, these two pieces are by the same guy, like that last piece. That's his distinctive stylization. So hopefully you remember from sixth grade when we talked about that word. So stylization has the word style right in it. And it means when you can recognize that a work of art or a piece of music or a style of architecture or fashion, that it's from the same period of time or the same um, part of the world, or in this case, the work of a particular artist. So what is his style? So one of the primary uh, things you'll notice about Tristan Eaton's work is that he has these images that are made up of these other smaller images that come together to create a whole. And it has this collage effect. The word collage comes from the French word colère, which means to glue or to paste. And traditionally, when you think about a collage, you're thinking about literally pieces of paper that are cut or ripped and then glued side by side or on top of each other to create an image. Based on my observation of Eaton's work, the paintings he's ma he makes are based on digital collages he makes, not actual physical collages, because you can see there's a lot of effects that you could really only get digitally. So those kind of shadows um, that are very smooth where each piece sort of begins, where abuts another one. And also, like, if you look on the red area, there are the white outlines of, I believe those are hands, like, kneading something, I guess, um, creating or gathering salt. Um, and that, those kind of tiny outlines um, would be almost impossible to physically glue. So I believe it's created digitally on Procreate or in Photoshop or something. And once he's created those collages, he puts them inside of the silhouette of uh, usually a figure. So if you look at the silhouette, that shadow shape of the figure on the left, that's a pretty recognizable silhouette. Even if you didn't see the glasses on the face, those little round glasses inside the silhouette, you can probably recognize that that's Mahatma Gandhi. And this particular piece is called Salt March. And it's about a protest that Mahatma Gandhi um, organized in 1930 in India. And Gandhi is considered um, sort of the father of nonviolent protest and civil disobedience as a means of um, getting political change to happen. And so this SALT march was protesting uh, an unfair legislation, a taxation that the British had put on the Indian people because at that point in 1930, India was colonized um, by the British. And so that was a way for them to um, get money for something that the Indians could very easily have gotten for themselves, the salt. So 
um, again, this is a discussion about um, this, this artwork is a discussion about a political situation. And Tristan's Eaton's work is often political and sometimes was very controversial in nature. That's something that really goes back to his street art roots, I think. Uh, let's see. Okay. Um, so Eaton carefully chooses the images and the pieces of the images that show through in his work. And he uses text as well. And that's really compelling you as the viewer to make connections between the various parts of the image and to recognize that they're telling a story. So he actually did a series, Tristan Eaton, of images called Legacy. It's not the same assignment that you guys are doing. It was based on his own people that were important to him in his own life, um, like family friends and artists and his father. And he very carefully chose not just to use parts of their portrait, but also to use imagery inside the collage background that tell a little bit of the story of that person and their legacy to him. And you can see that there's something similar going on in all of his images here. So obviously this is called the Selma March. This is about the, um, the Selma March in 1965 that was a major part of the civil rights movement and really led to the passage of uh, the Voting Rights Act, which was key, a key piece of leg legislation for the civil rights movement. Um, and again, another act of civil disobedience. So you see Dr. Martin Luther King there. You also see the open sky um, through sort of the architecture of the bridge that was crossed where a lot of violence took place. You see the very racist headlines um, that were in newspapers at that time. You see the Alabama flag, which has the Confederate flag in it, right? And then you see some of the um, anti-March protesters um, who were threatened by and violently opposed to the civil rights movement. So there's a lot going on here. There's also this little bit, which I think looks, I think it must be um, like a an aerial view of the layout of the streets of Selma. But when I first looked at it, this kind of grid thing here, I actually thought it was the print of a shoe, like the bottom of a shoe, which is also interesting because it was a march. Another thing that's really cool about Eaton's work, and that I think you should pay attention to in your own work, are the changes in scale. So when he's putting these pieces together, he's really thinking about having some things that are really magnified, like this uh, part of the flag here or this text here, and then having some things that are sort of normal size, right? So Martin Luther King fits, uh, Jr. fits, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. fits the size of his silhouette perfectly. And then you have all of these kind of scary dudes inside the silhouette of this other guy. So they're much smaller. So having that change in scale, that change in the relative size of images, and of course, having the contrast of black and white images with vividly colored images creates a lot of visual interest. It really draws you into his pictures, his paintings, and it makes them feel very energetic. So Eaton was clearly influenced by pop artists from the 1960s. So this is actually a painting by a different artist named James Rosenquist. Um, you can see there's kind of that um, collage effect going on. There's the combination of black and white imagery. So he was clearly obviously a big influence on uh, Tristan Eaton. Side note, James Rosenquist actually had a house in Bedford before he passed away. So pretty cool. Um, so the pop artists of the 1960s were interested in popular culture. They were, so that's why it's called pop art. They were interested in consumer culture, right? So um, the commodities and buying and selling and how that's a big influence on our lives. And also famous people and events and his, you know, um, politics and history. Another thing to keep in mind about Eaton's artwork is that he appropriates much of his imagery. So if you look at this truthless image over here, that Ruth part might look familiar because it's actually from the candy wrapper of the Baby Ruth label. <laughs> and that's a perfect example of appropriation. So appropriation is a huge concept in contemporary art and music. Um, and it means when you take uh, imagery or anything from another source and you incorporate it into your own work. So it's different 
than plagiarism because you're not passing it off as your own. It's kind of pretty obvious like, oh, that's the baby Ruth sign. He's not pretending that he invented that. He's kind of nodding to consumerism and um, what that has to do with the idea of truth. Um, that's kind of the idea of his whole painting. So artists are appropriating images and appropriating styles, like he appropriates um, some of the the style of James Rosenquist. That's what artists are doing all the time. And musicians do it too. Every time an artist, a musician samples another piece of music, that's a kind of appropriation. Sometimes there are issues with copyright and they have to get permission, um, depending on if something's in the public domain or not, depending on how long it's been available. Um, but that's something that artists, contemporary artists are working with all the time, that idea of appropriation and when have you changed something enough to make it your own. Another thing to keep in mind is that um, you don't have to worry about appropriation because you're making a piece of art for an educational purpose. So it's not when you're borrowing images, you don't have to be concerned about that. It's more for artists that are um, promoting their work at a much higher level. So here are my tips for your legacy project, okay? Um, things that I think you should keep in mind when you start following the amazing video tutorials that Miss Brooks put together for you. They're really incredible. So when you're choosing a portrait of your chosen reformer, look for an image that's simple, not a ton of stuff going on the background in the background that's going to be distracting. Look for an image that's easily recognizable. And if not actually black and white, at least it has really strong darks and lights. So not a kind of faded picture. It'll be a lot easier if the picture is, is pretty um, intensely light and dark. You can also decide, is your image going to be just the face and shoulders of your reformer? Or is it going to be something where they're in a pose, kind of more like that Gandhi image where you see the whole, or the, or the Dr. Martin Luther King image, the Selma image, where you see the whole silhouette of the figure and that relates in some way to their cause. Um, for your collage background, when you're finding images that relate to your reformer and their cause, you want to choose images that tell parts of their story connected to their legacy, not just their life. So you really want to think about what has been the profound impact of this person and what visuals can I find to collage together to tell that story. So you, they, not, not all of the images are necessarily going to be of your person, right? The, the, portrait that you're kind of overlaying on the image that you're putting all of the uh, collage inside, that's going to be the person. The images inside may include the person, but they may not. They may just be connected to their legacy. So you really need to think about even what you choose to search when you're looking for images um, so that the images you choose are going to tell that story. And as you place your images together, you want to create a composition that has some images that are larger and some that are smaller. So you get that real push and pull effect with the change in scale. That's really key to Eaton's work. And I think it's key to making your work visually interesting. You also want to have some images that are black and white and some in color. And you want to play around with your placement of images in your collage, um, your digital collage that you're doing. So just because you plop something into one part of uh, the square doesn't mean that's where it has to stay forever. Play around with moving things from left to right or top to bottom until you feel like you have a composition, a layout that is dynamic, that is interesting, and that pulls the viewer in. I usually, there's no exact right or wrong. It's really a judgment call, but there's usually a point where you kind of play around. You're like, oh, yeah, that's right. That feels good. If you just plopped it there because you're, you know, too distracted or or not interested to do it come back to it a few minutes later when you feel like with fresh eyes and you can make a better judgment call whether you want to work digitally using miss brooks's awesome 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 tutorials or you can do like an old school collage with actual cut paper um, which as i said is one of my favorite things to do so Whichever way you choose to work, if you want to talk to me about your specific piece of art and you want to get feedback or you have questions or um, anything like that, I'm always just an email away. So feel free to reach out to me. We can communicate by email. I'm happy to set up Google Meets with anybody that wants to. And I'm really, really excited to see what you guys produce.